welcome everyone to this month's Backup Recovery Office Hours. Um, my name is Timothy Chen, uh, the Director of Product Management in the Oracle Backup Recovery Technologies team. Uh, today I have Brian Cooling, um, who's our Senior Principal Product Manager from the Customers Success Services team at Oracle. Um, together we're going to talk about Oracle's Recovery Appliance ransomware protection architecture and a new uh, services that Oracle offers to help customers deploy uh, recovery appliance and also um, configure uh, for the vault. Uh, so uh, let us know if you have any questions. Um, there's a Q&A function here. And then at the end of the time, we'll also open it up. So let's get started. So I'll start with just a overview of the recovery appliance and uh, some very key capabilities uh, that we have developed for ransomware protection. Uh, just a level set, and then Brian will uh, present the new services and also speak to some details on uh, what's involved in the, in the engagement there uh, with the customer. So ransomware, uh, as we all know, uh, keeps making the news time and time again. Um, I really believe it is the greatest threat to business survival in modern times. I mean, it is... Uh, it is so much more sophisticated, damaging, and, and pervasive than any kind of uh, HA or DR type of uh, uh, compromises or, uh, or events that have happened uh, in the past. And it just keeps getting uh, larger and larger, right, in terms of the breadth, the depth, sophistication of the attacks. Because you see here some of the stats, uh, we're talking about um, hundreds of millions of attacks per year. Uh, this is back in 2022. Uh, the cost of uh, of a breach uh, is multi millions, right? That's probably conservative. Uh, that I, I would say, uh, in terms of the impact to uh, the business, to the end user customers of the business, to the internal users of the business, and the processes that depend on those data and systems, right? Uh, ransomware is also going to cost um, customers billions of dollars annually to rectify, okay? And, and so that is one of the big things is that IT environments are very complex and have many different, right, systems, applications, and uh, ransomware is such that it's kind of uh, indiscriminate in terms of its attack. And so it could take out any or all portions of, of your environments. And so trying to piece things together, trying to clean things up, trying to reinstate things, uh, is not an easy endeavor at all, uh, especially if it's a large major attack. So the cost of doing, uh, of, of protecting uh, with, with solutions for your environment, uh, the cost of manpower uh, to be able to um, work on these situations and resolve um, the incidents uh, adds up, right, tremendously. And the last point here is that um, the business gets hit. Um, there's There's downtime. You know, whether that is for internal uh, employees and the business, uh, the, you know, business they conduct um, with customers and the effect that has on their productivity. Um, we also have downtime for the end user customers when they can't actually access, say, public websites uh, or get the information they need on, on their uh, timely basis, right, for their businesses uh, and dependencies. So that downtime is, is a big issue. And for the databases, this is a even larger problem. And so even a few minutes of a ransomware attack, for example, can can impact hundreds or thousands of transactions. Uh, and databases work very differently than just, um, you know, any other kind of application or just files, you know, a file system, uh, there's transactional records there. And so there's a lot of uh, interworking of changes, uh, data changes of records that hold those changes and across multiple systems, many multiple databases. So uh, the impact can be very devastating to the business. So let's take a quick look at the cycle of ransomware and uh, kind of how we see the various um, uh, kind of the circumstances that lead to how a ransomware penetrates, uh, but also kind of the effect of that and questions that customers should be asking themselves um, in this cycle. So the initial attack is just a, is, is just um, starts with the team, starts with a malicious user, or an outside user who 
uh, sets up their command and control center. Um, they attempt to infiltrate customers um, through phishing emails, through sending fake software upgrade alerts, um, through doing some kind of uh, fake, you know, uh, user, uh, you know, even calling uh, customer service uh, to pretend to be a uh, legitimate business uh, or a vendor or something and getting access, right, to some systems. And so that's kind of where it starts. There has to be some entry point there. And question is, is that what processes and steps are in place uh, at this level, right? Um, and, and how are they being followed within your company? Uh, how is that first entry point being protected? Now, uh, when we move to the next side of the ransomware um, cycle, it goes after data, right? That's the, the main thing. It goes after data, uh, the data that is uh, can be littered across various servers or systems, um, and it attempts to find all the various credentials in order to get to that data, right? And, and so it kind of just harvests um, and, and tries to identify all these different types of files um, and also access points to be able to further infiltrate into the environments. Once it gets to the data, then it can start attacking. And that means manipulating the data, introducing foreign encryption into the data. Hold, and at this point, the, the data uh, can be compromised and and held hostage. And this is kind of where ransom, the return ransom comes from. It's uh, the data is unusable unless you pay the attacker um, a, a, an amount so that they would help, they would allow you to um, recover that data uh, and, and, and get it back. And that's not even guaranteed in all cases, right? That just by paying ransom, the data doesn't necessarily come back or cannot be uh, recovered. And that's a problem, obviously. So there's really no no solution here in terms of what the ransomware uh, demand is. Now, once you have the data attacked, you got to look at what your backup uh, strategies are. I mean, this is where backups become so much more prominent in, in this um, world, uh, and not just for uh, you know operational uses. And you know, you know, everyone takes backups day in and day out, but we need to be really cognizant of how backups need to really. Uh, uh, be reliable, be resilient, and also be very um, attuned or integrated with the application that it's recovering, right? It's not just um, necessarily a set of desktop files that need to come back. For the database, it's very specific type of recovery procedures, and those things um, need to be understood by the backup recovery solution. And also, obviously, with your production systems, the patching schedules, the vulnerabilities, that need to be addressed um, with uh, critical patch sets and so forth. Those things should just be part of your entire management uh, process, right? For to keep your systems up to date. There, once the uh, ransomware can uh, get to the production systems and hit the data uh, and access points, they also attempt to get into connected systems. And this is where the lateral movement of the ransomware is. Uh, is extremely insidious and uh, penetrates, like I said, it can penetrate backups. And so that's where you are at the last line of defense. And um, unfortunately, many customers that we've seen in the news uh, get into that situation or um, they don't know where their backups uh, really um, are, are organized, uh, if they can be recovered in general, but also can they be done in a timely fashion. And so the payment, we see news of it being done, and uh, that it can be very expensive, obviously, but also not guaranteed, as I mentioned before, too. So the number one priority that we see is can you recover your data? You know, can businesses recover their data? And so Oracle provides a breadth of solutions to help with this. And this is the same sort of cycle of ransomware. And we've put the various solutions from the Oracle portfolio kind of illustrate um, the various places right, the attack goes through. And so you start with the foundation, your last resort, which is your backups. And this is what we're gonna talk about in this uh, session is the recovery appliance and how it is really attuned and designed for database recovery, right? Resilient, validated, um, uh, uh, performant, like all these things are extremely critical for uh, databases that uh, traditionally have a customer's most critical assets, most critical 
business assets um, that they that they manage. Uh, and so we need to ensure that databases are well protected. As we go up to the other parts of the, the cycle for the production data, TDE is always recommended um, to encrypt the source data of the database. If TDE is in place and the data somehow gets attacked, that data cannot be un um, cannot be uh, you know, opened for clear access, right? Um, it cannot be used for extortion and purposes. Uh, it is encrypted, right? And requires a, a key, corresponding key, and the processes to be able to recover and open that data. So we have TDE uh, with advanced security and Key Vault. We also have our Exadata um, engineered system, which is our, uh, uh, sort of the Oracle's best platform for running databases both from a performance availability, but also security perspective where the Exadata machines have been security hardened uh, for this to um, make sure that the software is, um, uh, surface attack is very minimal. Uh, it is very locked, it can be very locked down in terms of access. Uh, and the architecture itself is is extremely, um, you know, closed in the sense of it's, 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 for the sole purpose of running Oracle databases. And so there's no general kind of file system access or something like that, that uh, customers may typically do if they build their, their own you know, environments. Now going up to the top, we have um, database firewall, Oracle AutoVault, uh, also DBSAT, uh, making sure that the database uh, privileges and roles verification um, are protected. Uh, we can also monitor SQL uh, and those trans th those changes for any anomalies with audit vault and database firewall. <clears throat> These are all kind of arsenals, uh, tools in your arsenal, if you will, from Oracle. Uh, and we highly encourage you to take a look at those. Um, today, we're going to focus on the backup side. And let's take a look at the recovery appliance then. Uh, the recovery appliance is our engineered system for uh, database engineered ransomware protection. Uh, it was designed uh, so several years ago for the sole purpose of providing Oracle databases the best uh, performance, resilient protection. And, and we do this through technologies that are only available from Oracle and de de um, developed by Oracle for Oracle databases. Zero data loss recovery, right, in the name of our product. Uh, that is through real-time transaction protection, validating that everything is good, uh, making sure the data can be restored very quickly, making sure that the, the system is resilient so that you have uh, both access to the box, extremely, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, segregated in terms of duties uh, and also making sure that, um, that the backup policies can be hardened and made immutable so that the backups themselves cannot be altered or, or modified. We talked about Exadata having a computed storage server infrastructure that's very amenable and designed to protect the Oracle database data, which your the backups um, do do comprise of. Right, is is Oracle data at the, at the base uh, level? CyberVault deployment is uh, going to be picked up by Brian towards the end of the the session, and how deploying recovery appliances in CyberVault can be accomplished, and the benefits there, uh, and how what our customers are are doing as well and what they're looking for okay so the cyber vault is actually uh for a newer solution for us um, it allows you to have that isolated physical copy of the backup in a separate location that is network isolated as well from the production centers so this is kind of a uh, a common um uh, solution if you will a method that uh, industry has, has gone towards now let's see how recovery appliance fits with your databases environment, and that is all protected databases of any um, Oracle supported version and platform can be protected by recovery appliance. As I said, real-time transaction protection and incremental forever backup. Now these two things are, are key to making sure the data uh, is kept um, up to date. Um, and I'll speak a little bit about those two processes in a couple of slides. We do recommend TDE uh, to encrypt the data making sure that the data is compromised, it cannot be used for any extortion purposes. Backups can be made immutable um, on the recovery appliance, and they can also be protected by a vault, right? And this is uh, connected through our replication processes to get 
the data transferred to the vault from the uh, production backup system. And this window, if you will, is the air gap. And that is controlled by the customer and the recovery appliance is then separately coordinated in terms of the replication functions. And it is incremental forever. Uh, it is also optimized with our incremental forever strategy. So um, saves a lot of bandwidth, make sure that the, the window is uh, kept as small as possible um, to allow those changes to go through. We also provide archiving to immutable Oracle Cloud Storage. This is for long-term retention backups. Uh, regulatory compliance, say for months or years, you need to um, keep your backups around. Uh, that feature allows uh, a policy to be set in the recovery appliance to do a weekly archiving of, of a full backup that can be recovered and kept for, say, you know, six months. You might take a quarterly backup that you want to keep for three years. Those types of uh, use cases are very amenable to archiving. You can also do the archiving on premise. We do support ZFS as an archiving destination. It's through the same um, Oracle Cloud uh, storage infrastructure APIs. So it's uh, on premise, if you will, object storage to uh, uh, to archive for recovery appliance. And uh, through all this, we have TD encryption and uh, preserved through the backups. Uh, and we also have, as I said, validation throughout uh, as, the, as the backups are created, as they're written to disk, as they're sent over to the vault um, or to the cloud, these backups are validated at many places. We've also done a lot of work with uh, regulatory authorities uh, in terms of uh, assessing the system for compliance uh, against um, particularly financial services with the SEC regulation that you see here, 17A4F, uh, stipulates some very specific requirements for immutability. And that's something we've also done. So taking a little closer look at each of these areas um, and the functionality. So TD is kind of uh, highly recommended, right? Um, this is not, this is because not only encryption keys are involved with ransomware, but also data scraping and extortion of, uh, of that data. So TD makes sure that data is unusable. And it is part of Oracle Advanced Security. Many of you probably are aware of this. Uh, the data is encrypted at the database level, right? So it, it making sure that it can't be used uh, by malicious users. Uh, there's It's automatically decrypted for the application. Um, so you don't need to change your application to use uh, the encryption uh, mechanism here in the database. The workloads uh, that the database runs is optimized even with TD uh, for low performance uh, and low maintenance overhead. And the encryption keys are only accessible by the privileged databases. No other systems or other parts of your environment are um, uh, involved with this. The, the framework that TD was built on was that the database user who manages the database should have the only access, right, to be able to get, um, the, the, to have the key and also be able to use it in, in terms of opening the data for use. We also recommend Key Vault. Key Vault is an excellent solution for ma managing these keys and making sure that the keys uh, are, um, are are segregated for various users, uh, for the various systems, uh, and uh, and also for when you distribute those keys that they're also managed properly. And uh, and there's a central kind of location and a management interface here. So Key Vault is highly uh, instrumental as part of this. And we also actually use Key Vault in recovery appliance for archiving to our cloud storage. So that key um, management is, is essential because the recovery appliance doesn't manage keys, right? We, it should be the database um, side only owns the keys. So recovery appliance does use the keys as well to, to encrypt backups to go to the archive. So taking a step into real-time protection, um, this is about the databases uh, being protected, not just with traditional backups, as you see here, we have some weekly fulls, uh, daily incrementals, and some archive logs, right, that are backup uh, jobs that are backed up through the day. You always have some exposure to data loss uh, in this strategy. That's just inherent in this uh, backup methodology. Contrast that with the recovery appliance, which is real-time, real-time protection, where the real-time redo data is sent directly to the appliance. That's the redo uh, 
formats or the data format that uh, DataGuard uses to um, synchronize standby databases. So it's the same technology. We've leveraged it now so that you can actually have the logs be uh, immediately created on the recovery appliance for recovery purposes. So no longer do you do the archive log jobs and a lot of that time and overhead is now removed by using uh, real-time redo for transaction protection. And this allows us to recover to the last uh, committed transaction uh, again, very specific to database and how the database works. Uh, it's extremely important when you're trying to recover uh, several, you know, various systems um, to a consistent point, and uh, and so that's very differentiating with uh, with our system. Now, with RMAN validation, uh, I want to make this point because the recovery appliance uses RMAN validation processes as part of its recovery validation, right? So when we talk about validation, we're making sure that the data blocks in the uh, are consistent and we make sure that the checksums in the blocks match uh, what is computed for the block when it's get when it gets read. So just imagine that any kind of uh, data block in the database starting on the left side where it's read by RMAN, we do that compare to make sure checksums are correct. That ensures that you know no data has been modified. Uh, from the last time the block was written. Okay. And on the recovery appliance, we've instrumented the same process so that to ensure that the, the block checksums are correct and also that the data files that compose that database are available for recovery. So it's as, as, as if you're running an RMN and validate, uh, which essentially mimics a real uh, restore, validate, restore operation, but make sure that um, all the blocks are intact, that all the files are available. And this same process is done for every backup, um, for every database, right, that is protected by the appliance. And it does this in the background. So any backup that's written to disk, it also gets revalidated on a um, regular schedule. And we also validate the data when it's replicated um, to your DR appliance or say your vault appliance. And it's also validated um, when it goes out to the archive cloud as well. Okay, so this is um, many places or touch points where the data is checked for physical consistency. It's very difficult to be very near impossible to have some a backup, uh, physical backup alignment or, or uh, compromise happen without the validation not, not finding it. And of course, if you do get a problem with the validation, then those uh, incidents and errors are alerted to the administrator for the recovery appliance, and they can then take further action on this, this particular databases that are identified. One of the bases for recovery appliance is the incremental fervor architecture. Um, as I mentioned, this is very key to our uh, recovery strategy because uh, recovery strategy requires full backups. And so incremental forever is the mechanism by which we get virtual fulls. And so what I want to show here is just how an incremental forever architecture works. Um, we take a full backup on the first day, and then on every day thereafter, it's just the incremental, which are just the block changes that you see here relative to the last full backup. And every day, then, a virtual full is created in the system. It's a set of metadata that has, uh, imagine, pointers to all the various blocks that are needed to restore that full backup and so forth and so on, that we create a every day's incremental creates a new virtual full backup that is ready to be used. This has tremendous effect to reduce backup performance uh, on the uh, impact on the servers, uh, also much less backup network consumption, right? Because we're only doing incrementals and no more those weekly full backups. And this is extremely important for large databases as well, uh, which are increasingly just more present with multi-terabytes and petabytes, right, these days. Now on the restore of the virtual full, um, you can imagine this process by which the system can take any of those level zeros uh, and upon request by RMAN, which is again, our same familiar DBA tool for backup recovery, a restore database command is issued with the recovery appliance and the virtual full backup is, um, is located. Uh, and it is then rehydrated into a physical full backup that is then returned to the restore database RMN session. And all that is needed by the database client is essentially to 
we store and apply just the archive log backups, you know, those ones that were generated by the real-time redo process that I mentioned, you have saved now all the time and overhead of restoring and applying incremental backups for a for number of days, right? That's traditionally what has to be done is incremental based uh, recovery. That's no more. And uh, so it gives us quite a bit of advantage in terms of speeding up the overall recovery process by having a ready to use physical full backup every day um, that can be restored. The, uh, excuse me, the restores also inherit all the hardware optimizations from Exadata as well as we support 10, 25, 100 gig connectivity as well here. Now, uh, a word uh, about the um, user access part of our system, which is separation of duty and the user lockdown model. You can see here that we have uh, sort of two users, one is the DBA, the second one is the administrator for the appliance. They have their own specific uh, roles. Uh, they cannot cross their roles and, and their access uh, that they've been given. So the DBA is responsible for just running our man backup and if needed, restore and recovery operations. Um, they don't have access to uh, to copy um, off the backups, to move the backups, to change any policies that are um, on those backups. Those, are, those policies are all under the uh, purview of the appliance administrator, right? Who has um, management responsibilities for the appliance to monitor the recovery health and the data and the backup statistics um, for those databases, but they don't have access to the DBA's side, right? They don't have access to RMAN to back up those databases. Um, and they also don't have access to root on the system. Um, these are day-to-day -day administrators of the appliance who have access to our uh, documented management interfaces. And, and similarly for the third user for the vault, uh, this administrator for the vault only has access to their own vault management and monitoring, no access to the production appliance or to the uh, DBA uh, operations as well. Now, we enforce root, which is needed for various um, purposes uh, for um, system level access, say for installing um, a backup client agent for archiving purposes. Uh, if you want to uh, need to do um, support on the system, you may need root access as well. But that requires quorum-based approval, which means two or more administrators need to sign off in order for a user to get uh, root access. So that gives us another layer where um, the system is protected uh, and that, that a normal access would just be to um, use uh, the documented interfaces uh, for the system. Now, within the immutable backup uh, area as well, we make sure that the backups are enforced and locked down on the system. So uh, a, a database that's protected by the appliance has two recovery window metrics uh, or settings, if you will. One is called recovery window goal, uh, and one is called uh, immutable or what we call recovery compliance window. Now, the, the goal is basically uh, how, what you know, is, is the number of days that the system will strive to keep backups available for and to, to meet the, that, that uh, goal. In this case, 30 days in, in the middle here example. And once a immutable window is specified, uh, in this case, 14 days, this is now the system uh, will, pref will um, prevent any kind of deletion of the backups or alteration of the uh, of the window for immutability, uh, users who try to go from change it from fourteen to seven, um, the system will not just start deleting backups older than seven days. It'll actually retain those fourteen days for the existing backups. So that immutable window is very stringent policy, but it meets those criteria that I mentioned for like SEC regulations and so forth that uh, customers need today. And this can be done on any of the systems, uh, your production, your vault systems, your DR systems. And in, in the cloud, you may also have uh, a immutable window for longer, you know, for longer term retention for months or years. And that can be done with OCI bucket um, policies set up as destinations for the recovery appliance archiving. 
just a quick um, high, you know, sort of flash of the co of this Cohasset Associates uh, assessment report. This is the auditor that we work with to make to ensure that recovery plans meets all the requirements for the SEC 17A4F. This is a compliance assess compliance regulation for um, financial services industry, and uh, most of our uh, customers in that in that industry. Uh, we're looking for this and uh, and has a lot of good information. A lot of the requirements even span to other industries that you can also look at. So um, you can take a picture of the QR code and um, or just look to our blogs um, link here in order to get the highlights and then the link to the paper itself. And uh, just to finish off, I want to talk about a customer use case and, and then we'll go into the cyber vault part of the discussion. Um, uh, we work with a customer. It was a Fortune 100 oil and gas company. Uh, this was a critical customer who um, provided infrastructure services, right? And they were compliant. They needed to be compliant with Department of Homeland Security, their uh, cyber information and security agency, and TSA um, cyber regulations. Uh, obviously, uh, oil and gas companies, energy infrastructure is extremely critical. Uh, for the country. So they were looking for solutions in this regards. Um, their traditional backup solutions uh, were not you know, meeting their, their needs. Um, a lot of the process was fragmented and uh, they had a difficult time to have a streamlined kind of recovery process in that way. When they went with the recovery appliance, um, they saw immediately uh, some really good benefits, uh, achieving fast zero data loss recovery across their enterprise. Uh, it secured their backups with immutable policies that I mentioned. They could do this on a database by database basis. They could essentially show their their internal teams uh, that these backups were uh, were were immutable, and here's a retention period, and and give reports right on um, on these backups themselves. Uh, sort of as an assessment for, the, for their own teams. They were able to simplify the um, data, the backup and recovery process into the into one team now. So there was a lot of efficiencies gained from that. And they also in, use um, Quorum approval for their admin users to gain root access. So they implemented um, our uh, control and also immutability um, features in order to allow the system to be secured right um, and, and make sure that the databases are, are are protected and optimized for that you can you can also look at this picture they have other applications that are running across all these oracle databases over 120 oracle databases running there and so it's just an example of how this solution really can change the game in some sense of how a, a company looks at ransomware protection uh, in, in terms of database value, right? Uh, and, that, and that's value in protecting transactional records there. CyberVault configuration for the recovery plans, as I mentioned, is uh, in a separate location, a separate um, network zone, if you will, in which an isolated copy of the backup is maintained. Um, Brian's gonna go a little bit more into this, but just as an overview, um, this process by which data gets into the vault is well controlled. The uh, customer controls the network access to get to the system, and the recovery appliance then uses replication uh, to open or close um, the data stream for the replication. And, um, and when the window's open, it can be open. When the window's uh, when the window's not available, it's closed. And when it does open, we replicate only incremental changes, not full backups. So that allows the window. Uh, to the vault to be as short as possible, minimizing that possibility of any intrusion or any kind of compromise um, during that time. And this is what the customer can prescribe on their own uh, at their own uh, requirements. All the backups are validated on all the appliances that I mentioned uh, to make sure that, um, that they're usable uh, and that uh, they're, they can be monitored uh, accordingly. And uh, enterprise manager, can be also siloed so that we make sure that uh, even management users and access are segregated across the production and also separate from the vault uh, locations as well. In Enterprise Manager on that topic, just a few quick metrics to show that we can do very granular 
uh, you know, database aware monitoring of recovery window. Uh, for example, how long the backups can be um, can be recovered for? In this case, six days. You know, what's my current state of um, of data loss exposure or RPO? This is the measure of my real time protection quality. We like to see less than one second or even zero. Uh, that's what we expect when we do this real time protection. And then your last complete backup that was received and validated. Uh, we have a very um, detailed alerts and warning system through Enterprise Manager um, on all these metrics that you can you can receive. And uh, we also have reports that can be sent out on a regular basis that rolls up this information. So as you see, kind of this whole management interface um, exposes all these sort of value of our of the recovery appliance in terms of the recoverability monitoring. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Brian, uh, who's going to talk about the Cyber Vault services. Brian. Yep. Thanks, Tim. Thanks very much. Uh, just a quick pointer that um, we now have... Uh, uh, an updated group for the services side of the business. Um, Oracle Customer Success Services now covers uh, the wide spectrum of the Oracle portfolio. Um, it ranges from on-premise data center, cloud customer, dedicated region, OCI, SaaS within OCI, and also now includes um, OU, um, and so we're very happy to have this as a uh, an easy to work with group. We hope because that means that your success is embedded in what we do as a as a, a functioning organization. We have many services that you're welcome to pick and play with. We make them available to you uh, individually, as it were, but you can roll them up into uh, annual services where we continually apply these services for you in order to help you either assist with your in environments or we can actually uh, move to uh, manage your environments. Just to recap, as far as the ZDLRA is concerned, for ransomware protection then, there's a few things on the cyber vault deployment that we need to remember. The idea is that we have an air gap backup copy. That's what we intend to offer. Um, it can be independently managed access and policies. And if you recall, we divide up the users who are administrating the different areas of the RAs. And so it means that, for example, the person that's managing anything in the CyberVault area, which is on a separate network, does not have access to the rest of the environment. They are split. So no one person can control the whole thing. So if they, are, as individuals, get compromised, for example, it means that uh, you're separated out copies, your backups, um, cannot be compromised. Also, it offers the audit and compliance reporting and the idea of retaining your copies for an extended period of time enables you to go back in time. It can't be removed. Therefore, um, you know, we're in a position to uh, complete an, an audit for an external organization. So, we want to be able to defend our databases from ransomware attacks. So remember, you've got the Oracle databases from any source, so it doesn't have to be on Exadata. So it's shown as servers and, and Exadatas. It can be on any platform. And remember that we recommend TDE to encrypt at rest. We have immutable backups to stop that problem about people selectively deleting things. Um, and that's 
in condition with the compliance policies. So that's good. We have the separation of duty user model. And of course, the hardware has been for a number of years, um, hardened compute and storage architecture. And there's the cyber wall only reached through a controlled firewall. And this in the often referred to as a, a clean room environment, you have your second RA, which is our, our recommended route for uh, providing a, a, a cyber vault. And if you wanted to be 100% backup immutable, then something which has been around for a long time is the ability to be able to support outputs to tape, take them off site, do it that way. And of course, uh, ZFS storage has already been mentioned. So you've got oh, two alternates there. But then actually you have a third alternate, which is, oh, well, you could also back up to storage um, in the cloud. And that's using object buckets and so on. Um, and that's pretty much infinite. You know, you could store for um, uh, many days, you know, maybe 60 days or even 120 days, um, much more than you could, say, on uh, an on-premise device. Don't forget, we have the end-to-end -end recovery validation, meaning we're going to compare the blocks, making sure on the fly that any changes are reflected accurately throughout the ecosystem. And we also have compliance reporting. So we're going to get alerts uh, and so on, as well as uh, long-term reports of any changes uh, which are not expected. So in terms of services, if you wanted to implement one of these, um, this is our recommended uh, route. Um, services you can get from um, customer success services. Maybe some of this is work that you will be able to do and, and some of it is work that you would prefer to get um, from uh, CSS, for example. So think of this more like a bill of materials of the kind of activities of things that would need to be done. So in this example, then, we do have an existing RA, which is a very good place to begin. Um, and we will be providing technical account manager assistance and also architecting the solution uh, based upon the components I'm going to talk about. Then for the existing RA, um, well, you may need to move, move it, a hardware installation, and then we've got configuration. And um, then we have uh, a service that we recently introduced called Backup Immutability. And that is dealing with um, integrating sources like, for example, an RA with an OKV, ZFS or OCI. So it's more than just um, setting it up. We also have cyber resilience settings that we can apply to the RA. And also, we will need the ability to do a replication, um, and that will be a, a single a single service. In addition, we will need to set up, and you may have already done this, um, protected databases. So the databases that are going to be held on the production array to move to um, the cyber vault. Um, they need to be they need to be protected and also enrolled. And then, as far as the vault itself is concerned, there's a certain amount of repeat of the uh, production RA, as you'd expect, because you we need to hardware install it, uh, you need to configure it. Then we need to perform this um, integration and setting up of uh, backup immutability. So that's both on the production as well as the cyber vault. And again, some cyber resilience. And of course, um, you know, we, we will have the replication as well. So in terms of solutions for cyber vault architectures, um, we don't really have a single part number because essentially all customers are going to be different. But what we do have are a number of fixed scope services that would appear on a quote, for example, with specific deliverables. And that's very important for most customers. They want to know 
what is this service going to include um, and uh, that's easily set out. We also have a TNM because obviously projects um, change in scale. So um, the most important thing, of course, is the project oversight from our technical account managers and the design architecture activity um, from our technical architects. The customer will supply the preferred air gap timing technology, um, usually tied to their um, network supplier um, that they've got in the data center, for example. Um, and it's very important that the customer retains control of that technology. And typically then we would see two scenarios of appearing all new, that's fine. Um, we can do that because maybe we need to move away from an existing supplier because they don't have some of the features of the arm and that, that we've been talking about just now or expanding existing, the ideal place being you would have got an arm and, and we add the cyber vault to that. So every customer's architecture is going to be different and it is very key to understand uh, their end goals. An example of a project that we completed over the summer this year is a large US bank and financial services company, and we just retain their, their privacy. Um, uh, it, it is quite a large bank, actually, with two and a half thousand branches um, up and down the country. Um, and they also had two regional data centers. And as far as this project's concerned, they were thinking about 500 plus Oracle databases. So that may not be every database that they have, but these are the ones that they are particularly concerned about. These are the mission critical databases that they want to protect and move to a, um, uh, a vault. As you can see, the intention was to use um, immutable backup policies throughout. You can see in the little diagram, actually, that they had uh, a DR site, so they have DC1 and they have DC2. Um, and in each one of those, they have established a recovery appliance to do their regular backups. Um, and they are taking their sources from Exadata, but also uh, non-Exadata sources of the database, uh, other platforms. And then they're a passing to a DC vault. And the vault on the right-hand side, uh, as you can see, there's a little um, a little timer uh, icon here showing that this is timer controlled. These, you notice, are completely separate networks. They, you know, you don't cross from one to the other because that's another potential source um, of security breach. And um, the uh, timing, of course, will be... Uh, controlled possibly randomly, um, you know, not going to be, you know, 10 o'clock at night every night because, you know, um, a potential hacker might start to learn the behavior of the system. So, no, it would be um, at, at, a, at a time which is uh, going to rotate round. It, it's not going to be the same time all the time. And obviously for a very strict, limited period. So in this solution... Um, one RA is mapped to a second RA, as we showed in our little example just now, and that is through a separate network. Similarly, um, a second RA goes to the DC vault, and then three and four in exactly the same way. You notice there's some concerns for DNS and NTP. So remember, you're not normally connected to the network. So where are you going to get that information from? You're going to get it um, uh, from within the vault. And the same is true, actually, for uh, an OEM instance, Oracle Enterprise Manager. Um, you would normally have a separate OEM in the vault as well. And remember, all of this is going to be managed by an individual who's only operating within the clean room environment they are not going to be able to access DC1 or, or DC2 of the production environments. So the result, uh, as far as the customers was concerned, is that, um, yeah, we have four recovery appliances in the cyber vault, as shown. 
we are using the feature of incremental forever replication and the flexible retention policies with the vault appliances. In fact, they moved from a retention of about 10 days up to 45 days. So that meant, of course, they needed more storage, but nevertheless, it gave them uh, a much better um, audit capability. Simply uh, simplify the restoring tests um, with the vault appliance catalog. Um, all the requirements have been met, and and there were in fact no other solution available uh, was feasible. Feasible. Um, an interesting point that they had set this up prior, using a different uh, supplier, using a different technology to the RA, and one of the issues they found was that although in theory it worked, it could not um, complete the incremental backups to the vault within the two-hour window. So effectively, that organization had to abandon that other solution um, before they moved to the um, uh, an RA-based solution. Um, as noted here, the actual window, it, which is a function, of um, how long um, it takes to to complete your change backups and obviously your networking um, into the vault um, was down to uh, two hours, which was really their design their design point. Just a couple of comments on sizing and methodologies, the sort of things that we would have to do. Um, and have done in this example, we would run on method one, we run scripts to analyze the actual data, find out what the rate of change is for that data. In this case, it was 3.1%. Um, method two is the idea of using the primary and standby for 14 days retention. And then again, calculating using that rate of change. Well, okay, so what's the initial backup need to be? and what's the uh, change needs to be using those current numbers. So we made an initial estimate with the customer, um, as you can see there, but the idea of improving the rate of change, hoping with peaks perhaps, and extending the uh, retention up to 45 days makes a big difference, of course, to um, the amount of uh, storage you need. So there's always going to be a bit of a design um, uh, discussion here at this point on, you know, how many racks does that really amount to? The other consideration is the air gap open time and using all the different sources. Um, as you can see, the RAs are listed there. Um, and the changes in number of terabytes listed in the column um, gives you some idea of uh, how busy the um, the systems are and how long does that take to replicate when you've got that amount of rate of change. And as you can see, even at the 7% change, it was down to uh, two hours. And that's because of that incremental um, block transfer where you just make these small changes and transfer them across to the vault rather than do a full uh, full backup followed by incremental backups. So with the 4% change, similar results, but of course, much lower maximum time to replicate. And as we know from the examination right at the beginning, it was the 3.1% uh, rate of change and here, uh, it makes a significant difference, even if you go to 4%. So it's well within the two-hour design point window. As far as the vaults concerned, it, you know, what are the properties? You know, what are your design points? Well, we know that you have to use upstream RA has to have a replication network, um, and they are going to be separate. So they're not going to cross over in any way. So you can't jump from one to the other. The traffic on the replication network is going to be firewall protected with a timer device. And we're going to use specific ports. And additionally, we're going to have SSHD blocked as well. 
And finally, the traffic from each source, that is to say from DC1, if you remember, and DC2, is going to be on separate networks into the vault, and then they're isolated from each other. So even if you did, and obviously we don't hope to this, even if you did manage to get onto one, you wouldn't be able to get onto the other. So here's our summary as far as um, um, ransomware is concerned. The breaches can be devastating. Um, it does make a huge material impact on revenue and trust as far as an organization is concerned. And it's becoming increasingly complex and sophisticated. So every time something new happens, obviously vendors have to react to that um, and remain ahead of the game. Modern problems require modern data protection, which you may or may not have. You need to go beyond the traditional backup and recovery, that's for sure. That was ideal for coping with you know, technical faults, malfunctions, and what have you. But this is beyond that. This is where people are actually going out of their way to penetrate your organization and finding ways to either take your data or to um, uh, corrupt that data, um, in, re encode it, all sorts of variants. So it's all about now data security, integrity, and availability. All of those are absolutely critical. So the recovery appliance, which is what we're featuring today, we think it's the world's best Oracle data protection platform. There's data loss because that's inherent in the way that the little blocks move one after the other. There is no gap there. The data validation end-to-end, -end, checking the blocks, checking the checksums, very fast restore because of the way that it's organized. And there's many other features as well. And we have deep in automated integration with the um, Oracle database. Um, that's what we're really proud of. That's, you know, it's a real, it's a real feature. So if you've not, not actually taken a look at the recovery appliance um, recently, it, it might be worth doing that um, just to see whether that solution uh, would work for you. And if you already have one, maybe you would want to consider doing the Cyber Vault example I showed you. Um, maybe not on that scale. It might be just a single RA. Um, maybe more than that. Don't know. Um, but again, we can. We're here. You know, we can help you get to that point. So thank you.